So welcome everybody. Um, my voice has a tendency to go low uh, when I talk. So just if you can't hear me anymore, just give me this, the sign and I'll try to push it a bit. So I'm working at uh, Swisscom in the innovation department. I'm um, heading a so-called product unit called security and intelligence. We have several topics there, but one of them so is uh, blockchain in the context of uh, the security activities. We've started two years ago looking at it. Um, and now I'm going to mention or to explain you a project we are working on uh, in the context of a consortium. <clears throat> I think this was the, the, this is the biggest Swiss cross-industry consortium around blockchain at the minute. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit more afterwards. So there are two parts in my presentation. First is about what we've done in the context of the consortium. And there's a second part which is more now driven by Swisscom, looking at how could we do this in the, uh, with, uh, with Hyperledger. <clears throat> So first about the project, <coughs> um, it's uh, in the context of a CTI project. So it's, uh, we got some uh, funds from the, from the CTI, from the KTI, um, to work on that project. The project is, um, the academic partner is the Hochschule from Lucerne. That's Matthias Bücher, who is uh, leading the, formerly leading the project from a CTI perspective. And uh, <coughs> so we've got, in terms of, um, Partners, we have uh, people coming from the, the banking world, so ZKB <coughs> and Incorbank, who are part of the main actors in, in the OTC market in Switzerland. Six, which is taking care of the, the interbank payment. <coughs> and then we have IT partners, so TINM, we have some colleagues from there. Uh, participating more solution solution providers, as I understood. Uh, Inventix, which uh, offers banking solutions or banking products, uh, has having Inco as a, as a customer, and Swisscom being also a solution provider in the in the banking banking world. <coughs> um, so, what is OTC? <coughs> so, these are uh, over-the-counter transactions. These do you know what OTCs are, or should I explain? Well, I can explain, but just for you, just to know, to judge a bit for whom this is something unknown or not. So who knows OTC? That's e easier to. Okay, some people don't. <coughs> so, OTCs, I'm not uh, from the finance industry, so I will explain it also in a simple <coughs> term, but basically, these are peer to peer. Uh, transactions made between people, and these are transactions which are not going through um, a stock exchange. <coughs> um, so the reason people are doing this is because basically these transactions are cheaper um, than doing it through a stock exchange. Uh, they are also more private, <coughs> so you don't need to ex uh, expose all the details from the from the central party like a stock exchange. But there are still regulators basically looking that uh, there is no money laundering scheme, so it still there is some transparency which has to be provided. We have lots of actors uh, involved, so it, even though it's a peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, agreement, there are still lots of uh, actors being involved. So <clears throat> basically you have a seller uh, who wants to s sell some shares, and you will have on the other side a buyer uh, who basically wants also to sh buy these shares. The seller will give an order to his custodian bank, that's where he has his account, <coughs> and uh, the custodian bank so knows the, cu the, the seller on both sides, they also know the buyer, but they are not the ones basically doing the transactions. Then they push the, de the details of the transaction to a brokering bank, which will group all these transactions from the same assets, and then they will try to find a match between the brokering bank from the seller part and the brokering bank from the buyer, buyer side <coughs> to try to find a match and make the transaction. The interesting thing is also the some information is not passed to the brokering bank. So the custodian banks know the, the, re, the retail customers, but that information is not passed to the brokering bank. They just see a certain amount of shares which wants to be bought at a certain price, <coughs> and that's quite important. And we have some other actors, um, 
look uh, around the transactions. So we have the share registry. They are the ones recording where the assets are going from which hands to the other. Um, SIC, which is doing so commissioned by the SNB in order to make the actual trans uh, a transfer of money. And the FINMA, which actually uh, is there from a regulatory point of view to check the details of the transactions. <coughs> the FINMA has an interesting role because actually they see everything. They see all the details of the transactions. So <coughs> why did we want to apply blockchain into this context? One thing we can see is that it's a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, and we have lots of intermediaries in between. So one thought could be that blockchain could be to enable that transaction in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. That's not what we, <coughs> that was not the purpose of our project. We didn't want to work against the ecosystem, but more with the ecosystem. <coughs> so the, the benefits actually uh, fr from blockchain that we derive from that project it's the immutable data. <laughs> so this is more from an auditing point of view. So for the FINMA, basically you have the auditing track uh, trail, trail records which are given by, by the blockchain. So you don't need to make some special auditing process to look at the transactions. The smart contracts offer this high level of automation. So it decreases costs um, uh, to make the transaction and it increases speed. One thing I forgot to say is that one thing we were told is the, for these, the way uh, OTC's transactions are happening right now, it can take between days to weeks for the settlement of the, of the transactions. <coughs> and here, basically, with the, automation, the, the business logic that we put in a smart contract, we can now uh, put this in, do this into a few minutes, best, uh, worst case, in a day. The distributed, art, distributed architecture, <coughs> which, uh, so this, these are more standard uh, blockchain properties, the fact that it's uh, DDoS uh, resistant and you've, you can be protected against the data loss since you have uh, copies of the data with several nodes. And the other part which is um, interesting, so it's the, the fact that we have the sign addresses and if these are corre correlated with uh, PKI infrastructure, which I will explain afterwards, then we have strong identity. So basically, we can track down who did which um, transactions. <coughs> and yeah, <coughs> so the, um, we have some main actors and, uh, and entities. So basically, we have three main entities. We have the um, selling order, the buying order, the trading order. Then we see the roles and the, the um, the rights they have on these orders. I won't go into the details, but, but yeah. So there is the order for the selling part, the order for the buying part, and then there is the trading entity which makes the link between the, the two entities, the buying and the selling um, objects. <coughs> and what I explained to you before is that um, the complexity we have here is that all the actors, they don't have the same visibility on all these um, on all, on all these objects. So, and that's, <coughs> so for example, the custodian uh, seller, the custodian bank sees the sales order but doesn't see the buying order. So this brings us, uh, creates some difficulties for us to put this information into a blockchain because then by default, all the, the oh, sorry, <coughs> all the um, details of the transactions are visible by all the participants in the blockchain. So that's something which was a real challenge for us. Um, so in terms of design, what we decided was to go with a private blockchain um, uh, because we wanted, so the, the participants have to be known and we want to have a stronger identity related to uh, behind each transaction. So this I want to make it clear, it was a private blockchain, not a public one. And what we've decided, so the, we started this project last year uh, last summer, and we decided at that time to do it on Ethereum, because uh, Ethereum already had lots of traction. You have lots of people uh, creating their DAOs in different domains. Uh, the different participants of the consortium had knowledge about Ethereum. Um, <coughs> and uh, when we looked at the alternatives, like Apologia at that time, 
it was still not mature enough or stable enough for us to use it. Um, but of course, Ethereum is, was main, is mainly designed for public uh, transactions, uh, sorry, public blockchains. So we had to deal with lots of um, hiccups, which I will now explain a bit. <coughs> so as I already alluded to it a bit before, the, um, the main challenge we had was leveraging the, the trade-off we had was leveraging the distributed uh, processing offered by blockchain, but still uh, respecting the privacy model we had. And uh, so smart contracts yeah, are very good for the decentralized data processing, <coughs> but the data, as I explained before, is visible to all participants. And if we encrypt the data, uh, that could be a way to ensure this privacy, then the problem is the the data is also encrypted for the smart contract. So you can't implement a business logic into the smart contracts. So there is a bit this trade-off between leverage, uh, respecting the privacy, um, the privacy guidelines, but still using uh, the smart contracts. Because <coughs> we didn't want to use it only for um, distributed data repository. So the way we addressed it, <coughs> so we did, we did some trade-off. What we decided was to encrypt the data and store it into um, uh, an external database. So we used IPFS. Uh, it was the first time we used IPFS, so it was also a learning experience for us to see uh, why IPFS, because basically there was, uh, it's said to be quite convenient with, uh, to use it with the blocks of Ethereum. Um, and so, yeah, we stored basically the data on this distributed database, and we only stored the hashes of the encrypted data into the blockchain. So then we could make a reference between the encrypted data and the, the blockchain. <coughs> so we had also to come up with an encryption scheme. Uh, I won't go into the details of this, but just trying to um, uh, basically to these encryption schemes replicate the business logic I showed you before, like, uh, and basically when a, a broker can look at the data first, it's had to be encrypted by a, um, a custodian bank and vice versa. So that's the, the way these and the keys are used, replicate or replicate that business logic. <coughs> um, so the data was encrypted, <coughs> not usable by the smart contract, but the smart contract uh, know the identity of the participants. So then, based on the role of the participant, we could, uh, we could uh, um, enter the business logic in the smart contract. <coughs> and so what the smart contract do is that they control the life cycle of the, of the order, and they also control, based on the roles of the parties, who has the right to change an object from one state to the other. So from the creation of an order till the processing of that order till the fulfillment of that order. So that's the trade-off we, we did. <coughs> um, now I'm showing you something which is, which is still in discussion in the consortium is how do we, um, now that we have a bit these this design principles, what is the architecture we can put in place to have a, a running process on it? So it's as I said, it's a working document or working picture. It hasn't been agreed by the consortium yet. But the idea is that um, each participant can have a, a node, a, an Ethereum node, and we enhance that Ethereum node. So as I said, we have the IPFS uh, module inside the, inside the node, so the Ethereum node. We also had the um, distributed the PKI infrastructure. <coughs> uh, and which encrypt the data based on the encryption schemes I showed you before. The PKI infrastructure is also supported by um, a certificate authority that we had to create. And uh, the encryption, uh, the, um, we use B, uh, PGP basically. So we had to uh, add these PGP modules in order to provide the encryption. But another aspect also, we could have a completely um, mashed network between all the uh, network elements. But the idea was also, like Incor Bank has, 
what we realize is some banks, for various reasons, some actually for security uh, uh, perspective, were saying they can't run the nodes in their data centers because some of the technologies which are used, like Node.js, are not certified yet uh, by the banks, so they can, can't roll this out in the banks. So they said, actually, they would be interested in having um, outsourcing partners running the, the um, nodes for them. It's not the philosophy of blockchain, but basically that's what we see uh, as a business requirement. So there is a mixture between some of the participants running their own nodes and some of them actually delegating this to IT partners, be it Inventix, be it uh, Swisscom, to run the nodes on their behalf. <coughs> So that's more or less where we are. Um, we are discussing now uh, how to make the, there is a, um, a video on the website. We can show you a bit of, of a, a demo of the, the, the system. It's not um, industrial proof yet. So we are basically thinking about phase two, where we'll try to come up with something a bit more usable. Um, and that's where we stand. <coughs> On the Swisscom side, we were not totally happy with um, this implementation because we thought it's um, the key management uh, we had to do around was a, a sort of a hack around the Ethereum node. Some of the business logics of this encryption um, um, uh, scheme, scheme schema I, I mentioned before is done outside of, of, the, of the chain. We had some problem of stability with the IPFS uh, modules. <coughs> and um, basically, it was very di difficult to, uh, to manage. What we also realized, it's um, Ethereum limits us in terms of requests we can make. Um, yeah. <coughs> so in between, uh, Hyperledger released a version. So we worked more on the 0 0.6, but very recently, the version 1.0 has been uh, released. And what we see is that <coughs> uh, Hyperledger provides some of the key functionalities uh, we want. So for example, there is an identity management module <coughs> which has its own certificate authority. Uh, we don't need to uh, bring our own encryption schema. We can leverage basically what's already here. Even with the 1.0, now you can have several certificate authorities for the for the nodes, <coughs> um, we can have the so the chain code. It's more for the smart code. So it's a more or less a different technology uh, terminology for the smart contracts. And here, the, um, it's more this concept of one we replaced the concept of blockchain by channels. The fact that now per node you can have you can run, they can run send several nodes, uh, several blockchains. Sorry, <coughs> several channels as they say. Um, and in order to go stronger <coughs> in this, Swisscom decided uh, at the end of last year to be part of the um, Hyperledger Consortium. So we joined it on the, I think the, it was the day before, the 20th of December. We are the first Swiss uh, company jo uh, joining the Hyperledger uh, Consortium. And that gives us a bit more insights on how the project develops. Um, a bit more support also from the community to, to not to debug things, but to know how to use it because everything is not uh, documented there. <coughs> so um, to explain a bit how Hyperledger works, <coughs> um, you've got an application, uh, and this application has to authenticate itself with the central, uh, the certificate authority, sorry. And then once the, you are authenticated, then the, the application can invoke smart contracts to be run and to be validated by um, endorsing peers. So the peers, they will be in the business logic of the chain code. You can say, here is my uh, transaction, my, the, the transaction I want to run. And here are the different uh, people who need actually to also validate my, my transaction. So once they run it and they find the same result, they can send the result and send it back to the application. 
the application then will send <coughs> the sign transactions to the order. So it's, there they come with their own terminology, but um, do you know Hyperledger or not? Or do I explain something which is one knows? <coughs> so the order will, um, <coughs> will, actu will actually afterwards run their consensus um, protocol in order to append a new block and to order the transactions to append a new block into the, into the blockchain which are registered with the endorsing peers. So that's, that's a bit of a simplified, um, simplified view. <coughs> but what I was saying before is that um, what's also good with Hyperledger is that, or with Hyperledger Fabric is that you can have different channels, <coughs> so different blockchains running with different peers. And these could be completely isolated. So they, this provides actually the privacy we are looking for. You can only put the peers which have to be involved into the transactions, and you can exclude the others. And for this, you only need to create a channel, a blockchain, for where only these ones will have access, will have access to it. <coughs> and the other thing, and you can use different uh, uh, certificate authorities per, per channel. The interesting thing is also that the orders even though they are part of, diff of different channels, you can, use, you can leverage the same. And you can also, there's this concept of uh, um, pluggable consensus. So you can use different consensus um, uh, models or algorithms to reconcile what should be the state of your blockchain afterwards. <coughs> but you have questions you are still linking both blockchains, no? Because they are all living on their own. Yeah. So you are still linking them somehow. No, they can be completely. So actually, some peers could be part of two block, uh, two different blockchains. So you can have some peers which run two different blockchains, but then they are really separated. I, and that's what we show here. Actually, is <coughs> so the idea is to leverage this concept of channels so that you only put the custodian banks and the brokering banks involved in the transaction for this channel. <coughs> um, and you can separate them. As you can see here, you can have a custodian bank which is part of the same, uh, the different channels. So it's not that um, if you are in one blockchain, you are complete iso uh, completely isolated from the other. And that's actually a feature coming from the 1.0 that you can have you can appear, can run several um, channels. <coughs> and then having the regulator basically always at the intersection of all the channels because the regulator, the FINMA, needs to see everything. Depending on what, which criteria do you create a new channel? <coughs> based, on the, so based on the business logic. So if you say for these transactions, here are the different parties which has to be part of that transaction. Mm -hmm. you, in the business logic of your smart contract, mm -hmm. you can specify basically who, are, who is authenticated to have access to that, um, to that blockchain channel. Mm -hmm. mm. Does it mean that you have to create per trade a known channel? So no. no. All the trades <coughs> with these partners then could be you can oh, okay, yeah. could you can append the so you don't need to create a blockchain per transaction that would yeah, defy yeah. the purpose of yeah. it. <laughs> um, so we are currently working on this. It's still work a work in progress. The fact is also that the, um, the hyperledger is also evolving itself, um, bringing new features, and. We have some ideas. I can't disclose everything, but we have some ideas about how we could uh, could do it. So the the idea is basically still to put hashes in the blockchain and to put the data in external database. That's actually something that uh, um, uh, Hyperledger can do. Question: Why? Because if the consensus is cheap, <coughs> you can put everything. You can have a block which is huge. You could put everything in the blockchain still. We only put it outside because we are paying fees. Because still because of, uh, the one reason is still because even in the transaction, 
the, or even in one blockchain, still the actors don't have access to all the same data. If you remember the privacy model we have, the... Um, but does it mean that in the payload of the transaction you cannot sign what should every participant see? Instead of putting it outside, because outside means... So is, we still put the ashes there, so they still work. The design is not done yet, so what I'm saying now is some ideas we have, but it's not implemented yet. Um, but it's still true, you can still implement the business logic with the chain code, but without having all the details of the transactions. Mm -hmm. So the identity, for example, would be something you would try to keep outside. <coughs> so um, why do we want to go towards a fabric? It reduces the complexity of the solution, as I said before. We don't have to, the key management and identities are already handled by uh, Fabric. Fabric already um, provides some uh, standard-based um, PKI infrastructure. Um, we don't have to come up with our own cryptographic schemes. Uh, the thing, the um, SDKs to run applications are very open. So it's not like with Solidity where we are a bit um, um, limited for the debugging part <coughs> that also the objects have to be quite simple. But actually we can, with these SDKs, we can use uh, all the normal, normal languages uh, we want. There's this announcement about CouchDB. Um, so you can save the, um, the, the data. So the, the, the data can be backed up in, Cou in CouchDB which is a non-SQL database, and it, it manipulates JSON um, <coughs> objects. I haven't tried that yet, but basically it seems this will give us much more uh, power in, uh, in dealing with complex uh, data structure. <coughs> uh, the other advantage is that the, the business logic will be 100% uh, based in the chain, which we didn't have before. Um, and these, so these, these are more or less the directions we are, we are following. However, <coughs> um, we still need to, we are not fix, fixated on, uh, on um, Hyperledger. There is this um, Ethereum, uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which has been announced recently. Um, we have worked a lot with uh, Ethereum before. The banking industry is pushing much more this initiative. Yeah. So it has to do with, not with the Ethereum Alliance, but what does key management is handled by the Fabric mean? So you have this, um, you have this um, PKI. Uh, but why they provide hardware <coughs> modules, or what does it mean Actually, that they handle the I keys? Know. I was told, I didn't see that myself, but you can even use some um, uh, HSM with, uh, with uh, Hyperledger which you couldn't do with. I don't understand what the key, man because you said that's part of the 1.0, the key management part. What, what's changed in terms of key management, sorry? Now, before, so with the Ethereum uh, implementation we did, we had to do this next to Ethereum. So we had to implement that logic ourselves with PGP. We had to add a module to the Ethereum node. Maybe the encryption library managed. Or the code. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a chain code in Hyperledger where, where the keys are stored. But I think you have to understand that um, the difference between Ethereum and Hyperledger are massive. So it's not, it's not really the same type of structure. Massive. So we're talking about partitioning, right? This is more like a partition, a different system they use. It's a different way. So these channels are more partitions than actual blockchains. It's not the same type of technology they use in Ethereum or in a bit. So, uh, so to my point is, um, yeah, Fabric is still evolving very fast. Not everything is documented. Even us being part of the, of the um, Linux, Linux Foundation and having access to people who can answer our questions, it still takes time. And again, so as we still keep an eye on Ethereum because there are big actors, especially in the finance arena, pushing this. Um, pushing this. And that concludes my talk and just a little bit of publicity, <laughs> didn't say.
Uh, but we are looking for people, so there are, if there are some developers interested, just come to me after it, and I remove it. Um, with Hyperledger? Um, so I don't remember. I think they use PBFT uh, for the consensus right now in the experiments the team is doing. Um, and that's much faster, but we didn't try to test what would be the, the limit we would reach. Uh, but it's much faster than Ethereum. It's because the complexity is low. You can <coughs> you know the part, the partners, yeah. uh, so the, the trust model is a bit different, uh, and it's more based on this uh, uh, voting principle, basically. Is there a currency underlying hyperledger? Uh, no, I don't think there is no cryptocurrency okay. uh, no. because of uh, the private chain. You want to? Uh, hyperledger for me is a private blockchain. So yeah. By basic, I don't understand. Perhaps I don't get the point right, but I don't understand why you use private chain. I mean, you can do everything with, with uh, signing in, 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 in smart uh, smart smart <coughs> contracts. So uh, the benefits of blockchain for me is that it's public and not and, and you're, you're like cutting the main part out of it. And I don't get it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's a bit of a religious. Uh, Sorry? It's a bit of a religious discussion from my yeah. point of view. Yeah. Um, of course, it's, but I see the point that the main purpose really for blockchain and doing everything with blockchain is that it's public. Yeah. And that's what I don't understand. Besides, we can keep doing what we did before. Um, yeah, but still, uh, so, two things. Um, with a public chain, still, what we would like still is a stronger identification of the parties being part of it. And as I said at the start, yes, we could think about going orthogonal and rethinking how it's done and uh, trying to do more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, agreement. But Swisscom being Swisscom, um, yeah. we can't... At this point, is a of making it public. Nobody would be interested to mine. What is it? to verify the transaction, mm. except the participant. Well, to, to a certain degree, we wanted to... to be public. Imagine it's public tomorrow. What does that bring more? Nothing. Well, then you still have the... the transaction, what is inside. Uh, I think you still have the, the security provided by a public blockchain, the, the immutability. Votes, yeah. Um, but yeah, as I said, Swisscom being Swisscom, we can't go into the borderline and... Uh, regarding regulation, so we still want to do things at least the way it's accepted. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say, uh, some participants in over uh, on the counter uh, do want to have a certitude that the transaction took place, but uh, they don't want to disclose that they had a transaction. Because if everything is scripted, you're right. No, 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 no in, in a public. knowing that you yeah. have a transaction, so yeah. if a record of the yeah. transaction did, but there are, there are some regulation, I don't remember the name, the MIFID and so on, when uh, the identity has to be, uh, to be checked. And as I said, we didn't want to go head front with the regulation. And uh, so we, in a way, we still wanted to respect the regulatory framework. I don't think you have to think about this, that when you put something on a public blockchain that everybody can see, you know, you just need to be a smart cookie to figure out what he's doing. So businesses, they actually go, say, a bank, a brokers, they do some high frequent trading, some bond work, whatever, they put it on a public blockchain. If you're very smart, it takes you less than, than a week or two to figure out what they're doing and then just replicate the business. Nobody wants that. So, you know, it's, it's pseudo -anonym. It's not for, anonym. I mean, if you talk about zero cash in the future, completely different uh, story, but in that sense, public um, blockchains make no sense for most business cases. Specifically in finance, industry, endurance. There's very, very few cases where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
you uh, mentioned regulation topic uh, on your website of OTC chain, uh, you mentioned there is mentioned that uh, it is uh, compliant with MIFID or email and uh, what is it? Uh, <gasps> what is it meant by, by the how can the whole the chain uh, compliant with MIFID two or? So that I'm not the specialist on that one. I didn't, I didn't read these uh, regulations. So. <laughs> how would it technically be possible? I think it's this audit trail still when you register. I think the, the key point is uh, to know who transacted what with whom, to make it very simple. So that's <coughs> about the identity? That's a key. Then you have to trace. You can trace back to the to the, uh, to the actual buyer. Itself. So the fact it's compliant. Uh, here I repeat what's the. I think it's Lucerne, basically, uh, the academic partners who made that review. But I can't judge it for myself. That's why the feed mark can see everything, despite all the channeling and grouping and segregation and privacy. But the regulator can. Do you have a specific um, product that is in Switzerland that you are you want to use this for? Um, I don't know what the OTC market is in Switzerland, but you know things like currencies or OTCs. There's many you know sophisticated. Uh, um, yeah, there are, there are some ideas. Uh, options. So there are, there are some limitations. Um, I would say one of the biggest limitation we have is um, if we can apply this for assets which are already existing, which are where you already have paper forms, yeah. and how to bring this onto the blockchain. So we had discussions about doing it for um, only new assets, or there are some other ideas, but that I'm not sure I can disclose uh, for some of us structured product. So someone is waiting. So is there a particular reason why Node.js is used as a technology for the backend to communicate with the CA? Um, no, it's, so it's written, it, yeah, it was written here. It was just a choice of implementation. But as I said, the SDK um, that you have to develop your application, you can have uh, Java, you can have Python. I think they, they are pretty agnostic in terms of what programming language you use. <laughs> Yeah. So what about the transaction costs? Uh, can you say anything about that using your, your new idea? Um, again, it's a um, private chain. So um, you mean in, in comparison to a Bitcoin approach? or? Um, again, we, we don't try to make the, the computing power is not the discriminatory factor to append a new transaction. So there is no arm race for this. You check a token with you can always pull mm. stake. So it's more based on these endorsers uh, signing the transaction. Uh, now, I'm, are you talking about Ethereum or the Hyperledger now? Well, I, I only know Ethereum Hyperledger is, not I'm not very familiar with Hyperledger, so I wouldn't. So with Ethereum, yeah, with Ethereum, basically we uh, we lowered the le so again there is no arm race, so we lowered the um, the requirement for the proof of work artificially, so that there is no need to put lots of uh, compute power in it. And that's the limitation of the private chains versus the public chains. Did you look at proof of stake in the context with Ethereum? Um, no, with Ethereum we use proof of work, but again, it's a bit artificial. So, and and that's the limitation of using uh, a platform which is designed for public chain in a private chain manner. And we don't need proof of work for uh, Hyperledger. It would be different. If, excuse me. If when Ethereum goes to proof of stake, it would be easier to implement. Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought too. And they, I think they're working on it, but you can't really. Yeah, yeah, it should be the end of the year, theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs>
but you still have all the limitations exactly. about you know confidentiality and privacy. So this will make. Adding to an earlier question, uh, where does this start and where does it end? More specifically, does it, for instance, include the tokenization of the assets or are you also taking care of the matchmaking between the buyer and the seller? Or is that kind of deemed to be outsourced? Um, so the matchmaking, we are doing it, but in a simple way. So there is no high trading things or doing it super fast. Um, so we did something pretty simple to make the matchmaking, <coughs> and the other part was the tokenization. Um, yeah, we basically there we give an identity to the assets in the what we've done on Ethereum. I, I'm in the management place. Yeah, so that's the share registry I was mentioning before. The share registry, which so creates, which keep tracks. Uh, we implemented this or not? Michele, you remember? The share registry, the mechanism there. OK. Uh, but it's, it's part of the scope, so yeah, that we keep track of who owns which asset. So we did, we keep the identity of the assets. The shares are digitalized, yeah, of course. Uh, we know who has bought what, who owns what. It's clearly identified in the share register immediately. And if you do the matchmaking yourself, you can also prove the best execution and stuff like that, right? Yeah, that's a different topic. You know, in the OTC market, there's not a priority. Okay. Yeah, yeah the volume is quite small still in Switzerland. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the OTC trading uh, takes a couple of days uh, in the current system. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we can do it in minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so slow? So where is the? I mean, banks are. <coughs> no, well, that's a good questions. question. Um, we had this discussion with oh. the banking partners at the start, mainly because they were saying that uh, it's uh, on the phone sometimes that they do the transactions with Excel, uh, manual process. Sometimes they have to revert back an order when they realize that some. Uh, constraints were not respected and um, yeah I think that's the main reason it's more uh, a legacy type of uh, process but again I'm not a banker so to the shares which is normally paper from the storage of the buyer to the storage of the seller only then they custody can say the transaction is finished <laughs> and then it was done so the process is completely manual at the moment for many shares on the OTC markets that's the amazing reason why it takes it up to 15 days. Okay. Sorry, just on the time, that also depends a lot on whether you're internationally. I mean, doing a trade from Switzerland to Australia is going to take you a lot longer than mm -hmm. doing the trade. Obviously, I don't, I've never seen an OTC trade taking 15 days in Switzerland, but... Oh, it does. No, really? Okay, but, okay, so maybe you, I, I don't know. When you say a trade, when you say, we are discussing here about post-processing, not yeah. just matchmaking. Yeah, I know, but. Just the post-processing part, until uh, the payment is executed and uh, the, the shares is physically going for the custody of the buyer to the custody bank of the others. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you have to physically move it uh, from uh, the, the locker from one to the other one. Yeah. Yeah, but I would say that the international difference is usually the, the big, the time consuming part of it all. Yeah, but the market, the market is very small and it's very unliquid, not really liquid. In this yeah, case. that's, that's, that's an question. Yeah. One last question. Yeah, you are covering here the OTC market. Uh, we have already on your roadmap the normal market, because actually you have the same participants, the local, the project. Mm, no, I think we don't have this in our roadmap right now. To try to go towards the, the you mean the, the regulated? Uh, no, not not. Well, uh, <laughs> um, maybe I can't tell you. I can't tell you. Sorry for this. Thank you, David.